Hello, I'm Frank Pelea. I'm here with Joanna Hess at the Shaheenian Gallery. Uh, we're talking about the ninth annual Art Studio Views Tour, which happens this coming Labor Day weekend, September 3rd and 4th. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Frank. Welcome to the gallery. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. So tell us about uh, the tour. It's, it's, this is the ninth year. It's the ninth year of the Art Studio Views Tour. We've been over Labor Day weekend for eight of those years. And it makes it great for people planning to come to the tour because they know it's always Labor Day weekend, Saturday and Sunday, not Monday, although many people try to come on Mondays. And uh, some of the artists are willing to be open. Mm -hmm. Art Studio Views Tour, and um, this is a postcard that has all the events related to the tour. We've been really fortunate, a lot of the sponsors have had openings and art receptions related to the tour over the month of August, so it's been really fun. Um, the tour was started nine years ago by three women who wanted to bring the community into their art studios. This year, Frank, there are 27 artists, including you, yes. on the tour, yes. and there are three couples on the tour as well, mm -hmm. which um, have been on the tour for many, many years. Mm -hmm. We have five new artists, uh, six artists returning to the tour, and 16 artists who have been on it for uh, most of those nine years, actually. And Joanna, what kind of artwork will people see on the tour? We have people who do oil paintings, landscapes, contemporary abstract work, as well as very uh, realistic, photorealistic uh, painting. We have um, ceramics. This year I'm very excited because we have three glass artists mm -hmm. and each one is unique. Wow. Tom Stoner is a glass blower. Mm -hmm. He's gonna be Saturday only, so people really need to plan ahead okay. if they wanna see Tom and he'll be doing demonstrations. Mm -hmm. uh, Dia Archbold, paints on glass and fires it in a kiln. Mm -hmm. So it's her drawings that are on the glass. Mm -hmm. And Doris Coltero, who is one of the founders, is returning this year, and she does stained glass, uh, traditional stained glass, but in her own images. Terrific. And I see this beautiful brochure that you uh, uh, created this year, and I want to show the audience. Uh, it's just chock full of information, and it has a wonderful spread with all of the artists here in, uh, and with illustrations of their work and a wonderful map here on the side which is very easy to read and it's quite a quite a bit of real estate that the, the tour covers so yes. people should plan ahead perhaps do half the tour one day and well, half the tour Well, you're not the other going day. to get to all 24 studios. You can try. You can try but it won't be a quality visit so I really recommend people go online, check the website, look and read about the artists and see who you want to visit because um, 24 studios is a lot of mileage. We yes. go from Germantown down to almost Poughkeepsie mm -hmm. uh, on the tour. And I really, personally, I, if I get to five artists a day, I'm exhausted. Well, so, that's not, you know, 10, uh, 10, yeah. So you can, and, yeah. and two or couple, uh, three or a couple. So, I really recommend picking up the brochure. We have three headquarters, Betsy Jack Russo Gallery in Rhinebeck, the Tivoli Artist Gallery in Tivoli, and the Artist Collective in Hyde Park. They have brochures, they can help direct you, they have restrooms for people to use, and they have art exhibits. In fact, the tour artists are exhibiting at the Betsy Jack Russo Gallery and Studio through September 4th. A group show. Right? A group show. Mm -hmm. And the towns that the tour includes are Germantown, Tivoli, Red Hook, Rhinebeck, and Hyde Park. Yes. Right. So it's about a 45 mile stretch from Studio <laughs> in Germantown all the way down to the Hyde Park. So yeah. it is a it's lot of... It's an hour drive if you went from top to bottom. Just if you were driving. Just driving. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, um, is there anything else you'd like to mention about the tour that people should know? Oh about? yes, um, our, our presenting sponsor this year, we're so grateful to the Gardens at Rhinebeck for helping to produce this. Um, the tour is a free event, it's self-guided, meaning you can pick and choose who you want to go. You don't have to go in order from Studio 1 to Studio 27. You can pick and choose as you go. 
And we also have um, restaurant sponsors this year. So plan on stopping and taking a break every now and then. I also want to thank uh, Vicki Hack, who's a financial planner, the Rhinebeck Bank, and WDST, all our major sponsors this year. Terrific. I also want to mention for people to look for signs on the roads in this area, and they look just like this card, which is uh, a good idea for yeah. having them look the same. <laughs> and wherever you see these signs, look for arrows and numbers, and they correspond with the for sure, and it makes it easy for you to find particular artists. Okay, well thanks so much, Joanna. Oh, thanks, Congratulations Ray. on t uh, tour number nine, yeah. year number nine. And I'm looking forward to going to your studio this year, because you're much. in the unique Parthenon. Yes, so yeah, I'll be fun. kind of in the middle. Yeah, so. so you can be hit from both ends. Both ends, right. Okay, well thanks again, mm -hmm. and uh, hope to see everybody on the tour. We're here at Tom Stoner's Glass uh, Studio in Rhinebeck, and Tom just did a really nice demonstration of how he works. Uh, he made two soda glasses, soda glasses. Soda glasses. Pilsner glasses. Yeah, and they were beautiful, and uh, it looks like you've done this for quite a while, 30 years maybe? Is that a good... little, little more than that. More than 30, wow, than 30, okay. 70. Yeah, and uh, you really work well with your assistant. It's a beautiful... Uh, it's like a, a very choreographed kind It's a, like a ballet. Of, yeah. It was just beautiful to watch. Um, so, is this the first time you've been on the tour? This is the first time I've been on the tour, yes. Okay, and I understand you're only going to be open uh, Saturday and not Sunday, is that yes. correct? Okay. So people, make a note if you want to see Tom's Glass, you got to come Saturday, uh, 11 to 5, right? Right. Okay. Now, are you going to be, uh, obviously, I think you might be demonstrating. Uh, that's the whole point. That's the whole uh, point. I wanted right. to do a demonstration for the Excellent. community. Excellent. So, uh, people will be looking forward to that. There aren't a lot of people that do this wherever you live. Is that true? Is that correct? Uh, not a whole lot. Yeah, a ha uh, handful. But there we're, we're a lucky. community all over the country, actually. Well, I'm just talking yeah. about around here. Yeah, around. But I, actually, you might have a little competition. Uh, Poughkeepsie will have a glass blowing uh, yes. facility in the next year, year or two. I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's terrific. And uh, thank you for letting us uh, peek into your uh, studio today. Appreciate thank you your for coming. Time. And um, make sure you come out and see Tom's uh, demonstrations on Saturday, September 3rd. Uh, the ninth annual Art Studio Views Tour. Okay. So here we are. Uh, this is a, a, my garage, which I use as part, partly as a studio, partly as a garage. I have another uh, building that I use as a studio. But here I, I uh, install some photographs that I will have on the tour. Now, I'm a photographer and a painter and a sculptor, so I... I like to combine the, the mediums together in one piece. So I came up with this technique where I take a photograph, a color photograph, and I mount it on a uh, non-traditional surface. In this case, it's uh, kind of like a cement board. And what I do is I take the photograph and manipulate it. I rip it, cut it, tear it, uh, paint it, and I uh, adhere it to the surface with archival glue. And then I go into it again with more paint and sandpaper to build up uh, a real texture. I want the photograph to have the same texture as the real wall, to, to make it as close to a, a real wall as possible. So by uh, doing all these manipulations, I can uh, come up with a, a totally unique, one-of-a-kind photograph, because even though it's a photograph, it's I can never make another one exactly the same. So in a way, they're like a painting. And uh, here, these three are uh, from my Cuban mural series, which I was in Cuba a few years ago, and uh, photographed uh, Cuban murals, because I paint murals as well, and I'm very interested in what uh, murals look like in other countries. I've been to several countries, and I, wherever I go, I always photograph the walls, the billboards, the graffiti, the murals. So. Um, and this is one of the more recent series of that uh, photography. Uh, <clears throat> over here I have a sampling of some other photographs from California. 
I was I lived there for a few months and uh, took a lot of photographs there. The architecture is quite interesting. Over here, I have three uh, Italian walls that uh, are done in a similar technique with the manipulated, hand painted, cut, ripped, torn technique. So, um, for example, this one, this is the red here is painted. This area is sanded down with sandpaper, and this part is hand colored. This one even has uh, to also to bring the photo out into the reality. I actually added real wood to this photograph, so it becomes almost a sculptural piece. So this piece has three mediums: painting, photography, and sculpture. And here I have three more samples of the Cuban mural series. Uh, it, it, Cuba is totally fascinating to me because it's such a, it's a beautiful country, but it's so dilapidated. And over on this table, I have a few samples of my functional art, uh, which uh, take the form of lamps, photo lamps, photo coasters, and photo tables. I tend to put photographs on anything and everything uh, that I can. And uh, I can turn these on. You can see they're, uh, they're all different shapes and sizes. Uh, the images vary. Um, I have some uh, Italian images, American images, and they, they project the image because uh, I figure if you're going to have a light, why not put a photograph in front of it and illuminate the uh, photograph at the same time? And uh, here, these are, uh, this is a Roman aqueduct that I photographed in Spain. This was a little church in Italy. And then I get uh, and have fun with other kinds of found objects. I use these uh, recycled blenders. And uh, voila, you've got a blender lamp. I figure they're, they have two functions. Uh, they illuminate your room and they save counter space in your kitchen. So, and then here, here I have a few samples of photo coasters. And they also uh, are functional and they have a photograph on the surface and it's sort of like a puzzle. You can put four together and you've got one image instead of four, instead of four different images. Although this, this set here has four different images. And then I took, I took the uh, photo coasters and I put them on uh, small tables. And so here are the little small uh, photo tables that you can uh, kind of put around the house, put on your porch, put on your patio. They're waterproof and weatherproof. Uh, uh, they're made of uh, Italian marble with photo, uh, digital photographs. And they're also polyurethane and they're waterproof. I wanted to take you out here to see my other structure. Uh, this very unique building of a Greek Parthenon, which is going to be my uh, secondary studio for my photography. So let me take you inside and show you what I have. the Parthenon studio. Uh, it's still under uh, renovation so I don't have too much uh, work here to show you but I have a few, few photo prints from a couple of series. This one here uh, on this uh, part of the wall is a few samples of the Tower Music project that I did with the uh, composer Joseph Bertolozzi. He uh, actually played the Eiffel Tower as a musical instrument and I photographed uh, the two-week project. We were on the Eiffel Tower every day for two weeks. It was eight of us, and he recorded over 10,000 sounds and spent almost a year composing an entire CD just from the raw sounds of the Eiffel Tower. Banging, scraping, tapping, banging, uh, all different sorts of parts of the tower. 
Um, these are individual prints. Also, uh, I also made a book, a photo book of uh, Tower Music, which is available in stores and in the studio. And I'm here in Hyde Park at Carl Grieco's studio. Basically, it's his backyard. Uh, he works in marble and stone, and uh, he works outside most of the time. We're in his backyard with uh, several of his sculptures uh, displayed here. And here comes Carl. He's talking to the neighbor. Hey, Carl. How you doing? <laughs> you look spiffy in your white jacket there. Yeah, I usually wear this when I work. <laughs> okay. All doing? right. All right, Carl, tell us a little bit about how you work and uh, some of your tools, some of your techniques. All okay. Right? This is the old traditional sculptor's tool, hammer. Right. And uh, this is called the pitching tool, okay? The pitching tool is the first thing you use when you, you're going from a block of square into the round. So what we do is we take the pitching tool mm -hmm. and we knock off all the square edges. Like, I'll, I'll give you a demonstration right now. now it, it really takes a lot of material. You, and you go, wow. you can, so you start rounding it off that way. See what I'm doing? Yeah. Now you see what wow. I got? Yeah, it takes big pieces off. Too. Yes, yes. So you got to be careful you don't take too much off. It moves a lot of material. Mm. But what we do is we draw a line what we want to carve. Right. And we we cut, say, two inches in front of it, not near not it at all. the line. Right. A little bit, right. When we go to the line, we start using the point. The finer tools. Right. This one here, and we, we use it like... This will shape out. This is just a demonstration stone. Yeah. But at the point, we start going to the round. And then after the point, we take this one here is what you call, it's a ripper. Uh -huh. You're still doing a rough. Rough, yeah. But, but you're getting close to the line. So now you got two, two points. Two points. Mm -hmm. And you start to refine a little better. You know, you take, oh, I shouldn't use it. This is for pneumatic. There's two different type chisels. The carbide, pneumatic chisels, and I have the hand chisels. Hand chisels of steel. You don't want to hit these with the hammer because you can spoil the edges for, the, for this, for the carving, the yeah, pneumatic chisel. But usually I start out by hand. It's a nice... Nice feeling to work by hand, I'll tell you. Just, I think of the old masters and what they went through and how they worked. They carved for, for days by hand, can weeks. You do, can you do a little bit with the uh, the small, like the small? Um, yeah. Or maybe even this one. If you, that's, we're not, we're, you're not there yet with this one, right? No. You've got to do okay, more so rough work. What we do is we go with the oh. point yeah. and we, we start. It moves a lot of material. I should have my goggles on. Yeah. See the way that? Yeah. And then after the point, we go to the tooth chisel. But not that one. You gotta use the no, other this side. one. Oh, now you're ready for this? Yeah. If you're running, it depends. I can okay. use a hand chisel or the. But I thought you didn't. Want no, this is a to... machine chisel. I shouldn't hit it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That goes in here. Oh, and we use yeah. a pneumatic. Ch we cheat. We use an yeah, okay. air tool. <laughs> okay. Michelangelo would use it too. Yeah. If he had it. If he had if it. He had poor it. guy. So we got these. These are the points. Uh -huh. uh, tooth chisels from the point. We go to point to teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the teeth get more and more as you go along refining. So, and then after your final, you get through your roughing out with the tooth chisel, then we use the flat chisel. Uh -huh. Then we take off all the scrape marks scrape from marks. the chisels. From the teeth. From the teeth. Cleaning yeah. up. Mm -hmm. You clean up. They call that modeling. Right. Some artists exactly. modeling is with clay, but yeah. that's what a sculptor calls yeah. modeling. Yeah. You take off all the, the teeth uh -huh. that was left on, all the roughness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, after the flat chisel, then we go with rasps. 
Uh -huh. These are special rasps. These rasps, they're not, you wouldn't, you wouldn't buy them to use on wood. They're made for steel. A lot, most of them come out of Italy. A lot of these tools come from Italy. Oh, really? Hmm. And uh, so now I rasp. I rasp by hand. Hmm. I just take the rasp and I run the rasp. Yeah. That gets it down a little smoother. Oh, right? yeah. It takes off all, yeah. yeah. See what happens when you're chiseling sometimes. We get what we call bruise marks in the stone. Yeah. From the hmm. point chisel, the teeth on the point, on the chisels. Yeah. You get these bruises. So this is what's going to help take them out. You, you rub them out. That's then, a lot of that's a lot of laborious work. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a, it's a passion. People say to me, "Is it a hobby?" No, it's not a hobby. It's a passion. Right. And uh, so you work in flat uh, relief sculpture as well, three dimensional and yeah. the relief. Yeah. Free, yeah. like a freeze. You call it a freeze. Right? Yes. Yes. This one mm -hmm. here. I was. I'll tell you what. I was inspired by my wife's. One of my wife's. Gar uh, she does fabric art, and uh, I was inspired by one she did in this style. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to try that in stone, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what I did. I do a lot of reliefs. Yeah. Matter of fact, I have the relief on the walkway. Right, right. Freeze. And that looks like this kind of stone Similar in the walkway. This. So yeah, is this, it is the same stone. Yeah. This is limestone, too? Yeah, it's a hard limestone. Ah, because it looks almost like marble. All right, so that wraps up Carl to, uh, now, and now we're going to move on to his wife. Marilyn Johnson, who really? does textile work, and she's uh, about 10 feet away. So let's go and talk to, uh, to Marilyn. <laughs> so here we are just a few feet from Carl's studio uh, in the backyard, and now uh, we're in Marilyn's studio, mm -hmm. which is very cute and cozy here and nice and cool. And uh, she's at her sewing machine, and uh, she's going to talk to us about her work. We have a few samples on the wall. and. Uh, my mother taught me how to make some clothes, and I made doll clothes, and then as I was growing up, I got into embroidery and uh, cruel and all, all of the, the womanly arts, as they call them, and uh, I found quilting, and I quilted for about 20 years, and uh, I discovered that I wanted to do something else beyond that, so uh, everything always still works with a fabric of some kind or sewing of some kind, because uh, that that's my background, that's how I feel the most comfortable. So I do everything besides um, sewing. I hand, hand dye a lot of my fabrics. Um, I use a lot of mixed media work. I bring in um, foils, if you can see up in that piece there, it's got foils uh, yeah. and metal. Um, I'm always experimenting with, with new techniques, at least they're new to me and I like to play with them. So. There's a piece up there. I found something that actually shrinks and, and um, uh, crinkles the fabric, and I thought I wanted to play with that. So that turned into that piece right up there that's called Pebbles in the Stream. Marilyn, this is such a beautiful big piece behind you. <laughs> Talk about that one, because it, it sets the colors. just fantastic. Oh, well, I'm color. I love color. Yeah, I love to it. play with color, and I like the way color um, bounces off other colors, other uh, blacks, mm -hmm. and I like embellishment. So I just found these gorgeous tropical colors when I was out shopping, and I, well, I had to do something with them, and this is this is what I did. Whatever you want. And then if you step over here, this is my take on uh, um, prayer flags. Oh, right. So each one of them is torn fabric and um, hand dyed and a hand quilt, uh, machine quilted, and they have foils and metals, and uh, each one is individually quilted with bright colors. So this one I am making strips that I'm just budding together and sewing with decorative stitching. Um, decorative stitch, just, you know, not, not okay. sewing them together in seams, but just budding them together and over-stitching them. And um, eventually, that it will also be embellished. And, and uh, this one I find uh, attractive, the, the grid uh, piece there. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's my little funny take on people say, oh, it's a quilt. But it's not done like a quilt at all. Those were all um, hand-dyed pieces that I then um, machine quilted and, um, different, and I stamped over them. And then I cut them up into little pieces. 
and butted them together and sewed them together and uh, I like to do it in a in a dark to light sort of pattern yeah. which goes so, back almost so to there's Amish. a lot of lev levels of work on each piece. I mean, you could just go out and buy different colored fabrics and just sew them together, yeah, but that but would be too easy. But you really... <laughs> well, that's that, the, these are my own because yeah. they're hand-dyed, and right. then I stamp them, and then right. I individually quilt them, right. so you, and then I put them together. A lot of work. A lot of work. I like to have a lot of whimsy in my work, too, so if yeah. you look on that wall up there, mm -hmm. the top piece was another experiment. Yeah, I see them over here. The, uh, little birds. That yeah. was all hand painted and then I applied the birds in... Uh, Very good. Very uh, original and creative and um, seems like you're having a really good time I making I have a lot these. of fun making making things and experimenting and, uh, new things and to be honest I haven't seen anybody else do quite the same kind yeah, of work. Me so. neither. Me neither. Glad so. that we could give you the opportunity to explain all these little secret <laughs> things that you do because you know when you look at these you say oh okay these are sewn fabrics you know and uh -huh. that's it but wow there's a lot more going yeah. on so good for you so well all right thank you Marilyn Hi, thank you for coming Thanks welcome for to my studio and hope everyone will enjoy visiting all the studios on Art Studio View this weekend I'm here with artist Melissa Braggins and she's going to demonstrate for us her very particular technique of uh, monotype printing right. using stencils and then later on we'll talk about your ceramic work. So uh, Melissa, show us what you're, what you're uh, all about here. Okay, so what I have out here is some ink that I've started to roll and I'm going to go back over to the palette here and roll across. I've got a mix of colors today and then I'm going to move from the palette over to the press um, there's many ways to work in monotype. I could actually take a brush right now and start painting, or I could wipe out. But the way I've been working uh, is to cut stencils and then to just add them into the image. So I'm laying in all these different stencils that I've cut. I've actually drawn them first and then cut them and then inked them up. So I think we'll go ahead and try that. Um, again, the paper is going to be a little smaller, so some of this may not all show. But I'm going to take some rag paper that I've already prepared and just put that on there. Then I put a newsprint to catch the extra ink on the side mm -hmm. and a blanket. This is a um, electric press. So what I'll do is I will put the tympan down here. The plastic actually is helpful with this scraper bar here that's also plastic. So the two of them touch. The bed of the press goes under the scraper bar. This is the pressure actually right here. That goes down. That's a grease there so that the two plastics can um, move against each other. Now on this press we can also do lithographs as well from stone and metal plate. And then I will pull this up and you'll, we'll see how it printed. So then you have a print. So Melissa, I see you have other works here in your studio mm -hmm. and they're quite different but yet similar but they're on a three-dimensional uh, ceramic uh, slab. Talk, talk to okay. us about that a little bit. These are some of my pieces that I've been working on in the last year and a half or so. Um, I've been using similar printmaking techniques to do them. I was invited to um, work with an artist that I've collaborated over the years, Margie Huto, and she asked me to combine some of my printmaking techniques into the clay. So I work Right on the surface, I embed some of my stencils. Um, I'll roll these stencils actually right into the clay, mm -hmm. push them in, and then I'll use different glazes over them. Sometimes I use a, um, a paint roller, similar to what I would use for the printmaking. Mm -hmm. And I do some actual 
uh, additional drawing into them and painting on top. So what's been really exciting for me is to see this process um, working and then to also be a little more three-dimensional with my work. Um, and when the clay is damp, it's a good time to actually manipulate the clay when it still has a little dampness to it. So. Very good. All right, well, thanks very much, Melissa. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, and now we're going to talk to Ted Braggins, who's mm -hmm. waiting in the wings. <laughs> All right, Ted. Well, we're uh, we're with you now in the same studio, yes. and you, I see you have your work up right. and around with Melissa's. But your work is kind of different. So uh, tell us about your technique and how you approach art, and uh, what inspires you, and that kind of thing. Sure. I see you have photographs here. Yes, absolutely. So I am a landscape artist, and I've kind of been working in landscape for a number of years, uh, thirty or forty years, actually. Uh, generally, my way of working is I like to go out on location. Uh, often I will do like drawings or sketches. Uh, Frank has a drawing that I started and brought back to the studio and worked on. Or oftentimes I'll go on location and do like a watercolor sketch as I have here on my right. Uh, this is actually not far from here, right up off on Yance Road in the town of Red Hook and mm -hmm. Homestead Farm. And then I'll bring my camera also and take pictures and then using Photoshop, I'll stitch them together mm -hmm. and try to make a composite that I can use mm -hmm. for making a visual image. Uh, so I work in that manner. I go to the work to the press that you saw with Melissa, and then I'll frequently make a cartoon, like a line drawing that goes underneath. Mm -hmm. and then I do the monotype method right on top. So this is actually a print of those composites here coming together of the uh, part of Homestead Farm right up mm -hmm. there on the Ants Road mm -hmm. uh, where they have the uh, sheep and wool uh, place. Uh, but this uh, is, what kind of print is this? So this is a monotype. Monotype. Okay. And it's a painterly technique where you work directly onto the printing, printing press. Right. And some people have asked me, well, why don't you just do a painting? Wouldn't that be easier? And for me, it's the immediacy and the responsiveness of the printmaking method. You work directly, you put down a ground, you paint into it. And then there's the, uh, the serendipitous aspect, if you will. You never really know quite exactly what you're going to get. So, But I see the, the sky. Yes. Um, is this printed first, the sky? Well, sometimes I may and do a ground first yeah, and the and sky and everything. But generally, I try to do it in one fell swoop. I will put down a sky in a blended inking pattern and then, for example, here you can see these yellow undertones coming through because I thought it played really well on the light. Uh, and then that'll, then I will work directly into mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. as a ground mm -hmm. as I'm painting Yeah, I can see and drawing. Yeah, the clouds painted right over the, right. the blue. Yeah, so and this this is a long view. It's out in Eastern Duchess near Charlie Hill Road. and so. In that sense, I kind of do regional things. Um, I'm doing a whole series this year called Upstate, Upstate uh, Homage series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is like Eastern Duchess. This is another piece, Upstate Homage, uh, Madison County, up off Route 20 near Morrisville, New York. I like it. It's very abstract. This is nice. Yeah. And that's sort of what kind of like kind of sends me a little bit, if you will. So I like breaking down the geometry and then also working with long and deep space as well. It looks like you're really up high on this one. What do well, you this on is, a mountaintop? Looking it's down? not quite a mountaintop, but it is actually on an opposing ridge. Pretty high up. Looking down and across a, a valley. Yeah. Yes, so that's that. Hmm. Uh, okay. And this is, you know, my way of working is kind of to try to incorporate uh, that long view, but with a painterly approach that's very direct and uh, so these are all monotypes, even though they, right. they look like paintings, and they kind of are. Yes. And they look like prints, which right. they kind of are. And that's why they call, so, the monotype is called the painterly print. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, thanks very much, Ted. Thank you very much. Uh, you really enjoyed uh, doing a double whammy today with uh, your, yourself and Melissa. Thank you. And so uh, that basically wraps up the art studio views tour video and uh, 
Thanks for watching, and I hope you tell your friends and come on out to the tour September 3rd and 4th, 11 to 5 p.m. It's free, and it's a lot of fun, and you'll learn a lot, and maybe you'll grab some bargain art pieces for your collection. And uh, bring the kids, too. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.